praise the Lord. Wonderful Saviour is Jesus, our Lord. Here we are at Paradise Now Church midweek teaching again. And we're going to be reading out the New Testament today in Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to start reading in verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the Apostle and High Priest of our Confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honour than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast to confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years. Therefore I was angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, we're in verse 12, Hebrews 3. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, for we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, as in the rebellion. <coughs> okay. I'll title our message today, Holy Brethren Partakers. Holy Brethren Partakers. There's the three of them there. Paul was speaking to holy, holy people. He was speaking to people that were considered brethren and he was speaking to people who were considered partakers. Partakers. Partakers of what? Partakers of the heavenly calling. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. No mistake in this there. No mistake in that. And there's no argument that 
Oh, you know, I don't think they were born again. <laughs> I don't think they were born again. You know, they weren't really saved. They didn't really know Jesus. You know, they just had a, like a religious uh, understanding of God or something. No. Very clear. So, um, I read an article once uh, by a woman who called herself a, uh, a teacher of God's word. And uh, the actual letter was about blind faith and had this Calvinistic slanter um, of things. This tells me she was blinded to the truth of Scripture that she shouldn't even be teaching because she was not in full understanding. of scripture and uh, the reality is also that God never God never really gave it to women to teach men anyway but there's a lot of men out there today if they are called if they can be called men um, who just keep their mouth shut don't they and just let the women press on with their teaching and leadership and being heads of churches and pastors. And, and all they say is, oh, it's best not to go there, you know, there's nothing wrong with women pastors and women priests and this and that. Unheard of. Um, There's a woman uh, in this who wrote this letter. Um, it was uh, relating to fake converts. Um, being uh, unaware, of course, that Scripture says and shows us that. Uh, Converts can also uh, um, be apostates. You don't have to be a fake convert. <laughs> you, you, you can be a converted one and end up a, uh, an apostate. This is what she said anyway in this letter. She said that uh, fake converts come on their own terms. Uh, do not, fake converts do not forsake all. They haven't given all their life to Christ. And they take Jesus on the end of their life. And they think they, they, think they have entered, but they have never truly repented. So Calvinistic, isn't it? So once saved, always saved. But uh, you know, the point I want to stress here um, today is that just because someone is born again or even converted, it's no guarantee of salvation. We, we like to think that, you know, this once saved, always saved, you know, it, it's our security. That our, um, we've made some sort of confession or, uh, you know, we've apparently been born again and truly born again. I'm talking truly born again, truly converted, not fake converts. 
it's always the you know this once saved always saved camp trying to concrete always trying to concrete this uh, well they weren't really born again you know if you're really born again you're really saved forever but uh no we want to look at the apostasy of the doctrine of absolute predestination or salvation by election, eh? And um, apostate is, is an apostate is one who forsakes, or one who forsakes their belief, one who forsakes the way they're they're travelling or walking. So, um, you can't forsake, you you can't forsake something you've never had. Um, I believe at the end of the day, I, I, look, I really wish I could just leave it, you know, once I would always say, just leave it and ignore it and hopefully it'll go away. But it's on, you know, every turn I take daily, I come across someone that has been hoodwinked into this once I would always say. It's either saved by grace alone or saved by faith alone. It's one of them. And then if they say saved by grace through faith, what they mean is headspace, that you don't really need any proof or action of your faith. So it's just as bad, isn't it? <coughs> At the end of the day, it's just as bad. So holy brethren partakers, I, I see this as a triple emphasis. Triple emphasis um, here today. And as we move through those scriptures, 1 to 15, Hebrews 3. Verse 6 says, But Christ as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. You see that there again? There's um, there's that word if. Um, that word confidence. And the word end. They're the, the next uh, triple emphasis. That's the next triple emphasis. If we hold fast the confidence, or that would be faith. I even believe the faith, because it says the confidence or the faith, and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Then it goes into verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, not a man, not a man, not a religion, not the Pope. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. As in the rebellion, the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years. And God got angry with the generation and said very clearly, they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. There is a rest. 
there is a peace, there is a joy. Salvation is the, the greatest rest we can have. To be in the safe place, to be in right standing with the Father. So, um, are we blind to the faith? I believe we are blind to the faith when we uh, read and and see only what we want. And there's none so blind that those who will not see. Um, we only read and see what we want when we want. That's worse than an unbeliever. So here we have forewarning the uh, the holy brethren, partakers, partakers of the heavenly call. Um, he's saying, "Watch out for an evil heart." We have to keep an eye on our hearts. Lest unbelief rise up. Lest the old man rise up again. Eh? He rises from the dead, the old man. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. It's an offering we don't take back. The greatest offering we ever give God, ourselves. It's an offering we don't take back. When we give our lives to Lord, it's given once, once and for all. It's an offering we don't take back. We know Jesus has no pleasure in them who go back to the world in their sin, don't we? They're not fit for the kingdom of God. It's an offering we don't take back. So beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Hebrews 3.12, can we get any clearer? Hey? Can we get any clearer than this? Beware, brethren, Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So, where does this evil heart come from? I mean, we've got holy brethren, partakers. And then that's in verse Hebrews 3 1 and in Hebrews 3 12. We have the evil heart of unbelief. We get the warning there. See, unbelief opens the door for departure, doesn't it? Oh, I believe. I believe. Do you believe? Yeah, I believe. You're saved. It's all done and dusted now. No, that's not so. <laughs> that is not so. Hebrews 3.13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. 
And now we have sin mentioned. But once they would always say, they don't bother about sin. Sin can't, um, sin can't stop you from entering the kingdom. We are told, especially by the new, uh, the new um, independent Baptists. the new fundamental in, I, I, independent Baptist churches, heretics, they say very clearly that sin doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you sin. Everyone sins. You, you can try not to sin, but you won't succeed. That's what they say. They say, you know, you, you, basically you've got no power. So you're no better off than the man in the street, are you? If you can't stop sinning, well, Jesus' victory at the cross was just useless. It was of no avail. Because Jesus came to take away the sin of the world. But the new independent fundamental Baptists called Jesus a liar. Every time they opened their mouth, Hey? And they make the word faith a, a dead, uh, inactive um, thought in the mind. It's just a thought. Hebrews 3, 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if... Every time we see if, every, you know, every time I see that if, I have to put a question mark. If we hold the beginning of our, I have to say faith, steadfast to the end. We have become partakers of Christ. We're partaking, firstly, of the heavenly calling, aren't we? We can't partake of the heavenly calling unless we're first holy, unless we're secondly brethren. And we know what scripture says. Scriptures, uh, who scripture calls brethren in Luke eight twenty one? Very simple. They're my brother. They're my brethren. Who hear the word of God and do it. Holy brethren, partakers, or people who have. Receive the Holy Spirit. People who do what Jesus says. And people who partake of the heavenly calling. They're the ones uh, who have become partakers of Christ. If they hold the beginning, if they hold fast the beginning to the end, if they continue to be led by the Holy Spirit, they continue to obey the Lord and do not forsake the heavenly command. Right? As uh, it says in, if we go over to Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10, in my Bible, it says, where are we? 
Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 29, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he or she be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant? by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of Christ. You see there? This is all... um, This is all uh, in line with what we're reading in Hebrews 3. Of course, Hebrews... The whole of Hebrews. The whole of Hebrews uh, agrees with Hebrews. Every chapter, and even Peter agrees in Second Peter two. Twenty one. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness then having known it, to turn, here we are, from the holy commandment delivered to them. Partakers of the heavenly calling. The holy commandment delivered to them. But it has been, but it has happened to them according to the true saying or proverb a dog returns to his vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire it's more serious than i usually quote i just say the dog goes back to the vomit and the pig to the mud but Peter really emphasises here and says that a sow having washed to her wallowing. You see, there's a there's a real taste for sin in there. There's a real um, this is very strong uh, scripture. This wallowing, you know, they're really enjoying this sin. They've gone back and they're wallowing in it. They're relishing in it. So we have to beware of unbelief, don't we? We have to beware that the devil will somehow harden our hearts. He'll first bring sin and temptation And the whole idea of sin is to harden the heart, right? Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And sin is very deceitful in that it tells you uh, everything is just going to be fine. (laughs) You just go ahead and do what you want to do and just wallow in it, and there's going to be no repercussions. Okay. The hardening of the hearts of people today is just unbelievable. And I talk to people daily See, this is a frightening thing. I've been on streets for 31 years. I've talked to a lot of people. and Believe me, a large percentage of the people I talk to come out of churches. And uh, what they tell me, I can only put it down to a hardened heart, seared conscience, and um, unbelief. 
We're surrounded by people today that they just don't believe the scriptures. <laughs> you can't write. I mean, you can't write scripture any clearer than it is written. I mean, is that, uh, if you hear his voice today, if you if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Well, every day I'm on the street, they they do that. The voice of the Lord or the scriptures are being spoken and they just put their head up in the air and walk straight past. And of course I always say to these people as they pass, you, you, can, you can avoid the preacher but you cannot avoid the judgment day. And that would be the true definition of a fool. A person, a man, a woman who thinks they're going to avoid the judgment day, just like they avoid that preacher. You will not avoid the judgment day and I will not avoid the judgment day. Impending on our behaviour and our position, that will depend on what judgment we go to, whether the great white throne or the judgment of the saints. So, unrepented sin, unrepented sin hardens the heart. That's the reality. Unrepented sin. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that it continually going on in known sin, there will be a hardening, there will be a fortification there and a reinforcement. Sooner or later, there will be a hardening. Or a strengthening in that area against God. And, uh, this will deceive us into believing uh, the satanic doctrine. And as I mentioned last Sunday, it's a soft soap doctrine, isn't it? Satanic soft, soft soap. It's a... Um, Absolute predestination. Well, in one way I believe in absolute predestination. In one way I believe in um, eternal security. In one way. And that would only be on Jesus' terms. I believe we are eternally secure if we do what he says. Right? Uh, I, I, I believe you, you can't forfeit your salvation if you do what Jesus says. That's what I believe. I, I believe what we're reading here is conditional salvation. Without a doubt, it's, it's conditional salvation. And so, uh, we're not going to be able to enter the kingdom um, Because of uh, um, if we don't believe, let's read it in Hebrews three eighteen. And to whom did we? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who did not obey. So we. See that they could not enter in because of unbelief. 
You see how Paul sows unbelief and disobedience together? In verses 18 and 19, And then we go backwards again to 17. Now with whom was God angry 40 years, or he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? Huh? This was it. Uh, this wilderness, uh, Egyptian, forward slash wilderness experience, is a type of born again. It's a it's a type of salvation. We got uh, all kinds of um, types and. and um, examples in the scriptures saturating the pages everywhere you go so there is no excuse is there there's no no excuse whatsoever and um There's absolutely uh, there's absolutely chapters dedicated uh, to um, teaching about apostasy and how people uh, um, behaved and how God dealt with them, even angels. Eh? Even angels. We read about that in uh, Peter, in the writings of uh, Second Peter, Second Peter, uh, chapter two. We can just zip over there just for a minute. 2 Peter 2, I mean, it had to be thick as two planks, we need to just try and say that oh yeah, I'm, I'm born again now and I have a Bible and, and I believe everything's sweet, I, I've been under the water. Now, I reckon I'm converted and uh, I'm home and hosed. No, it's not so. Paul is talking to converted people here in Hebrews chapter 3. These are converted people. 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1 But there were also false prophets among the people even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the Lord who bought them bring on themselves swift destruction and many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. And that's all they're doing. Once saved, always saved is blasphemy. They're blaspheming the truth. By covetousness, they would exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned 
but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. The way that Peter says in verse 4, 2 Peter 2, 4, if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell. Now, let's just have a look at angels for a minute. And we know there's no female angels, don't we? Which is just another wicked lie. God did not spare the angels. I mean, do you think the angels were carrying on like pagans and, and, and heathens? And... No. But when the occasion arose, they sinned. And, and you see what the Lord thinks of sin. And the way that Peter put it, if he didn't spare angelic beings, hey? if he didn't spare angelic beings, and he didn't spare the ancient world, and turned, Verse 6, turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who also would live ungodly. So our subject is ungodliness. Angels, the ancient world, Sodom and Gomorrah. All inclusive. Hey? All inclusive. But does it say in verse 7, and delivered Lot? No, delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of these homosexuals, of these wicked ones. Double emphasis, verse 8. To Peter 2, for that righteous man, not that man, the righteous man, dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul. Triple emphasis. Tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver, verse 9, the godly out of temptations and reserves the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Oh, but everyone sins. You, you, you can't stop sinning, the one saved always. <laughs> hey? These, these uh, heretics, these new independent fundamental Baptists, heretics, liars, cretins, hey? how terrible that they're preparing a place in hell for themselves. Reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, 2 Peter 2.10, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. Those who walk according to the flesh, not the spirit. We've been dealing with that. And last Sunday, uh, Romans 8, 5 to 8. 
Their presumptions, they are presumptions. Self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Whereas angels, who are greater in power and mind, do not bring a reveling accusation against them before the Lord. Goes on and on, doesn't it? Until we get down to our favourite verse again, dog returns to his own vomit. And... It doesn't say... It doesn't say that the dog returns to the vomit. As I always briefly comment, but his own vomit. Says that the dog, the dog returns to his own vomit, and the sow, the sow, to wallowing. Yeah. So it's our doing. If we if we behave like the dog, or we behave like the sow. It's something we love. It's something we like. We relish in. And. We return. We return. It's it's not. We can't blame God for it. We we can't say that God took our salvation away from us. No, we threw it in His face. Hey. We throw it in His face. We we smite the Lord. And treat his salvation cheaply. We, it's called in Hebrews two three, neglecting one salvation. How shall we escape? How shall we escape what? Hebrews two three. Oh, we, how shall we escape our presence? Our gifts. No, how are you going to escape the flames of hell? So if we're willing to hear the Lord today, let's not harden uh, our hearts against the truth, against scripture, like the rebels, hey? Eh? So, the light has shone once again today down the foyers of the darkened hearts of many if they would dare listen carefully. When we give our lives to the Lord It's an offering we don't take back. When we give our lives to the Christ, it's given once and for all. So we we must let the word transform us. eh? So that we're not... We're not numbered with the apostates. We don't forsake the way. So, uh, the woman that was doing her writing on fake converts, these ones saved always have liked to think that, you know, this fake convert teaching and conversation and preaching will smear and cover up all this uh, truth. About converts going back to their sin or the world and being damned. Holy, brethren, 
partakers, holy brethren, partakers. So, example after example, isn't it? The Lord throws all the sinners in together. It doesn't matter whether they're sodomites or angels. It doesn't matter. I mean, angels, uh, <laughs> prior to their fall, those who did fall, they hung around the throne. <laughs> They were in heaven. And when Lucifer jacked up, they were outed with him. And God very, very lovingly said, well, take who you want with you and uh, go your way. And that's the only way. You can't stay, you'll poison the situation, your poison, everything. You gotta go. Rebels have to go. Those who who want to do their own thing have to, to go. You can't have rebels in a local church. You can't have headstrong people. You can't have people who want to do their own thing in a local church. Because it just breeds rebellion. It, 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 we can't have that hardness. It's the reality, isn't it? I mean, look at the government. Look what's going on in the Australian government with the Liberals and the Labor Party. Just about self-destruct, you know, on the verge of self-destruction within the party, in-house, fighting and disagreeance and there has to be one accord. There has to be a leader. The leader has to man up. The leader has to take the reins and call the shot, stand firm, and those who are wanting to follow on and believe the leader and believe what's going on, they follow on. They don't wrestle with the leader. They're not twisting the situation, twisting scriptures and everything else to bring some other teaching into the local church or some other teaching other than the Liberal Party or the Labor Party who's ever in, reigning at the time. That's just the way it goes. If we don't agree with that, sweet. You don't agree, go somewhere where you can agree. Or where someone will agree with you, <laughs> one or the other. But once they've always said, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with going on in our own way, in the old man, in the old way. There has to be a new way, a new creature, a new heaven and a new earth. If you're a new creature, you're on a new way and it's a new and living way. We're told to walk in it. And you, if you do, you'll end up in the new heaven and the new earth. You'll end up in the new Jerusalem. It's going to be just beautiful. But this is all a part of warning and teaching, isn't it? As Paul did warn and teach, wanting to present all perfect, before the Lord, without spot, blemish or wrinkle. Holy, brethren, partakers. Triple emphasis. Good confirmation of John 15, 1 to 6, isn't it? They don't want to believe those people were a type of born again. Hey? Eh? Like that, those who come out uh, of Egypt. Hmm? They, they were let out and, and, and then they rebelled. 
Hebrews 3.16. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Right? Now, with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. And you can even say there, and paraphrase, so we see that they could not, uh, they could not, uh, um, they could not enter in because of disobedience. Because of disobedience. See, how do we expect to enter if we don't obey? How do we expect to enter all those blessings? Just forget about money for one minute. Just, just one minute, forget. When I say blessings, just forget about money for a minute. All those blessings, count, countless blessings... Money's there somewhere at the end of the list. But all those blessings, how are we going to lay hold of the, the provision of Psalm 23 unless Jesus is Lord? <laughs> it cannot be. He will never bask in the overflow of Psalm 23 until Jesus is your Lord. And most people today secretly say, I don't have no Lord, I am Lord. I call the shots, I'll do what I want to do and Jesus will put up with it and he'll save me anyway because I'm going to hold him to John 3.16, well, that would be a twisted John 3.16. Or I'm going to hold him to a Romans 10, 9 to 13. <laughs> that would be a twisted Romans 10, 9 to 13. And John 3.16, God so loved the world that gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord shall be so. Whosoever would believe, I should say, shall not perish. Eh? A verse that so many have misinterpreted. You know, land them in hell. Hey? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hey? Let me say sinning is not believing. Sinning is not believing. Going on and known sin is not believing. Freedom from sin is believing. When we believe the Lord, we abide in his word, all of it. And if you abide, you're going to know the truth. And that's what will set you free. So there's a great restriction there, isn't there? 
is only the truth. And there's only one truth, that's Jesus. No other religion, no other teacher, no other prophet but Jesus, the great prophet, Acts 3.23. And if we do not listen to him, and we do not hearken to him, we'll be utterly destroyed, as Acts 3.23 says. Utterly destroyed. So today, our message today, holy brethren, partakers, hey, eh? holy brethren, partakers. We can't hide it. It, it can't be hidden that once they've always said it is a devil's doctrine. There is a great falling away at the moment. And multitudes have fallen for the lies. And they're out there. The churches are still singing. The buildings with the crosses on them. Some have all the fancy gowns. That's all deception and lies. The priesthood. Still got their Levitical priesthood going on and still doing the Levitical tithing. They're not cutting the animals on the altar or anything like that. Not in this country, but they might start soon in in Israel. But uh, they're still collecting their 10%. They're still turned Father's house into a den of thieves. It's all the same. It's all, it, 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 there's just, it's just covered up a lot better and they're just more more apt to deceive. They're, they're better deceivers today, I reckon, than they were in Jesus' time. Eh? It's all there, the hoopla, the music, everything you can think of but the truth. They're building the buildings. They got their cliches and sayings, build the building and they will come. I don't see that as a as an oracle of God. <laughs> hey? They got all their dream centers and that's all it is. It's just a, a dream that will never come to pass. It's all deception. They're just dreamers. They got all their activities, they got all their programs. We're just about to move into the festive activities and programs. Uh, uh, grand, let me say, grand festive programs and activities for the year. It, it's called Christmas. And people absolutely adore it. They do it so much they have the children and the mum and dad sitting in front of that idol, in the front of that tree. I used to do it. I used to do it as a child, as a, as a good little Roman Catholic sinner, filthy little Roman Catholic sinner. I used to sit around the tree with, and mum and dad, dad would be over in, in his seat on his throne there drinking his booze. Everyone was happy. And mum would just, you know, gullibly going along with it. And everyone's smiling and happy. And we're all around the tree. And, you know, might even have a, a uh, nativity, miniature nativity scene in a figurine sort of thing, you know, under the tree or something. <laughs> I was terrible when I look back. How, how deluded. Yeah. And so it's all there, isn't it? And, and you know, I know about Jesus and Mary and 
I, I know about the unknown God and everything's fine. You know, no one can be like Jesus. But even though he said 1 John 2, 6, we must walk as he walked. But no one can be like Jesus. Hey? No one can be like Jesus, they say. 1 John 2, 6. He who says he abides in Jesus ought himself also to walk just as he walked. 1 John 2, 6. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on and on. One thing after the other. And people, you know, they let it slide. They let it all slide, one one thing after the other. And at the end of the day, you can only put one heading on the whole thing, and that's pagan. I'm not just talking about Christmas. I'm talking about the so-called doctrines and faith that they have. It's just pagan. And the devil loves it that way. Satan, I've said it for decades, Satan doesn't mind if you go to church on Sunday or Saturday. Oh, yeah? He don't mind. He don't mind. And, and then during the week, go down the, to the cathedral or go have some hoopla prayer, prayer meeting twice a week or something. And He don't mind that. As long as you're not hearing the truth and as long as you're not doing the truth, he, he'll even grow your club. He'll grow your satanic social club. He'll grow it. He'll be right in there with you like he was with the Laodiceans. Hmm? He's the God of this world. And anything of this world... He promotes, and even the worldly churches. He, he's behind them all the way. They're all backed by the beast. Hey? You wonder why the Roman Catholic Church and the Anglicans and Uniting and all them, they're so big and so uh, populous. They're so well populated and so many... People, you know, millions. It, it's because the God of this world is behind them. But there's a holy remnant out there. And I can tell you, they're not apostates. And they, uh, they haven't forsaken Jesus. They haven't sake, forsaken the truth. Hey? I'm going to finish up now. I'm going to go to the book of Revelation. And I'm going to go to going to go to uh, Revelation 3, verse 10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one take your crown. Hey? What do you think of that? No one take your crown. So someone can take your crown. You can forfeit your salvation, dear listener. We must continue in the faith to the end. As Paul the Apostle did, he fought the fight, he ran the race, he kept the faith to the end. If you don't keep the faith and you don't obey the Lord, you will not be saved. And I will not be so. We can keep the faith by the power of the Holy Spirit and 
by faith in the faith. So brethren and those listening on, you have a wonderful day. And don't forget to share this message with as many as you can for the sake of their soul. For their eternal well-being, I give you all the glory, Jesus. Amen.